Okay, good afternoon. My name is Sumin Chang. I'm a member of the uh, Methodist um, Imaging Center. Uh, I did my fellowship at Baylor College of Medicine back in the days that we still uh, together. How many of you guys, how many Baylor fellows are here? One, okay. Brave enough to come. Say hi to Dr. Lakis for me. Okay, today I am gonna um, give you some introduction about nuclear imaging. Very brief. This is the main application uh, for nuclear imaging. Assess diagnosis and prognosis for coronary disease. Uh, spec myocardial perfusion imaging, that's the, probably 95% of what we do here in Methodist. We don't do PET, but in other centers it's uh, commonly used. LV function assessment uh, used to be the uh, workhorse of nuclear medicine uh, 30 years ago. Now we rarely do it. However, is part of the information that we obtain from myocardial uh, perfusion imaging. Viability, um, adrenergic innervation, and uh, pyrophosphate for amyloidosis is also uh, coming as a strong indication, uh, but um, because of time, I'm not gonna touch, touch uh, base. Uh, so I'm gonna focus my talk in stress myocardial perfusion imaging for diagnosis of, of coronary disease. Okay, just a, a historical slide. Uh, nuclear medicine, nuclear cardiology started with assessment and ejection fraction. This is a paper by Dr. Jim Brownwell when he was in NIH. So just to give you a perspective. And this is um, um, a MAGA. Uh, in the old day, it used to be a gold standard for EF assessment. Nowadays, we still use it in rare occasion because we have so many other tools to assess LVEF. But in patient, for instance, can I go to MRI? I had a very poor cardiac window. Um, for ultrasound, this will be a very good uh, substitute. I'm sorry the, the, the um, movie is not playing. Uh, okay, so stress myocardial perfusion imaging. You know, uh, the rationale behind doing perfusion imaging stress is, is called, we call stress test uh, ischemic cascade. So in the absence, decrease of blood flow. First you get a perfusion abnormality, then you get systolic dysfunction, wall motion abnormality, and ECG changes, and then uh, you have symptom. So myocardial perfusion abnormality is one of the first sign of ischemia, okay? And this is based on this principle that we have differential coronary flow reserve in, in the presence of significant stenosis. You get more uptake in coronary beds with no obstruction compared to the one who with, with obstruction, okay? And how we do it in the nuclear medicine. So we, nuclear cardiology, we inject radio tracer who goes to the heart, get uptake by the heart, and then we put the camera around the patient. The photon leave the heart, is captured by the crystal, and then through some soft, sophisticated computer algorithm, you recreate the heart. Um, and then with the spec, we slice this in different or axis to give you a 3D representation of the heart so we can localize the, uh, the defect. And there's most, several protocols. Uh, the original protocol, the most, uh, the gold standard is do the stress portion and rest portion in two different days with two different injection. But because it's uh, a little bit cumbersome for patients to come back in two days, uh, protocol was modified into fit into one day you can do rest first or stress later, or stress first or rest later. In Methodist, uh, we prefer to do stress first, especially in patients without history of coronary disease, because if you have a normal stress, you can stop there, okay? So you can imagine, uh, much more convenient in patients receive much less dosage. This is an example of a patient with symptomat with symptom. Uh, you can see there, uh, the top part is the stress images and the bottom part is the resting imaging. You can see a clear defect in the anterior septal wall. And uh, here in Methodist, at Methodist, we do routine quantification, which is very important for follow-up uh, and uh, to see the therapeutic impact of the uh, defect size, okay? Uh, so, and the other important uh, use for this um, Technology, special quantification, as I mentioned earlier, this is a patient with non ST elevation MI, had an inferior wall defect uh, with quantifications, and with intensive medical therapy and revascularization, uh, the perfusion almost completely normalized. Okay, this is an example with PET. You can see the images are very similar. Uh, you can display it in, in grayscale, color square, doesn't matter. 
Uh, at this point, PET uh, is only with vasodilator stress because um, the tracer, we don't have a tracer uh, who lasts long enough for us to, but that's about to change because there's a new PET tracer could be done in conjunction with exercise. Uh, the other advantage, uh, I would say, uh, bonus of doing a microevolution imaging is you don't own, you're not only getting the profusion information, you're also getting the functional information in terms of LV size, LVEF, which also very important in addition that, uh, uh, to the uh, diagnosis of disease, such as this case of uh, women with uh, fixed anterior defect, if you have the functional information showing normal wall motion, you can tell that this is artifact rather than true uh, fixed defect or scar. Again, uh, EF, in addition to perfusion, adds significant uh, prognostic information for us to de decide management of the patient. So from the same study, you can obtain perfusion, EF, and size. They all significant prognosis, significant pro a predictor of prognosis. What's the indication for imaging when you suspect some, somebody who has coronary disease? Obviously, chest pain, patient, especially with the abnormal ECG, ST changes due to LVH, left bundle, patient cannot exercise, or you have a patient, especially in women, with equivocal ECG. Uh, imaging here, I refer also to stress echo, obviously. Um, but I think the mo more and more the indication will be focused on patient with non coronary disease, non uh, defect. Uh, in this, because of other uh, um, imaging modality was available, who could be probably better than uh, stress imaging for determination of coronary disease. Okay, so what kind of stress test as a fellow you're going to order, right? Exercise always prefer because you give you not only the perfusion information, the functional information is also very important, especially for prediction of cardiac death or total total death. Um, but in the, absence, in the presence of a patient who cannot exercise, obviously, or have left bundle branch block or pace rhythm, here in Methodist Hospital, a uh, uh, study was done here that vasodilator stress test using adenosine is much more accurate than exercise. Um, okay, so pharmacological vasodilator stress test uh, recommended in those patients uh, who cannot exercise or have left bundle or LVH or pace rhythm. Okay, and currently we, PET is preferring large patient because of better uh, photon energy uh, versus spec, dobutamine, really we don't do that anymore. Uh, it's only very rare occasion with, with dobutamine uh, nuclear stress test. Okay, but the important thing, the, the, the choice of uh, pharmacological agent uh, depend, you know, you have diperidamol, you have adenosine, you have uh, Lexiscan or rigadenosine, depending on uh, and the availability and uh, depending on the cost. Here in the U.S., I think because of the ease of uh, use, uh, Lexiscan or rigadenosine has uh, is becoming the preferred agent. Um, so uh, the protocol is very different. You can see the Lexiscan has become popular because, again, it's really easy. It's a bolus injection. Uh, so compared to dipyridamol and adenosine, which require uh, infusion, uh, which is a lot more cumbersome. And the data showing pretty much adenosine and regadenosine has similar diagnostic accuracy and also uh, in determining the size of defect. Uh, okay, for the fellows, obviously, this is very important when you're in the lab to know the absolute con contraindication for patient for, uh, order uh, pharmacological stress test ongoing wheezing, patient with history of asthma or COPD, if they're wheezing actively, do not give any uh, adenosine or regadenosine. Uh, more than first degree AB block, first degree AB block is okay if you monitor closely. If they have a hypotension, especially in the presence of severe carotid stenosis, it's okay, it's not a good idea. Or less than 24 hour history, use that diperidamol especially in patients who's taking uh, dipyridamol and aspirin for stroke prevention. Relative contraindication, if they have history of reactive airway disease and not, not actively wheezing, uh, regadenosine is, is a, 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 a selective adenosine receptor blocker uh, in the 
vascular bed rather than uh, bronchial or trees is very safer. Uh, caffeine, depending on the coffee, uh, how much amount, there's some studies showing it really doesn't affect the diagnostic accuracy. It might affect the defect size that you assess. And obviously, patients with severe bradycardia and conduction disease, you try to shy away from uh, uh, any uh, uh, agent uh, like adenosine or regadenosine. This is a new, uh, some of the new development. There's a new camera using solid state detector, uh, ultra fast, because in the old scanner, or well, not old scanner, traditional sodium iodine scanner, it takes you about 10, eight to 12 minutes, depending on the protocol, to acquire each set of picture. Okay, so uh, for some patient, especially elderly patient who cannot stay still for a long period of time, it's a problem. With this new camera, which you can see there, compared to regular camera, so the U UFC is called ultra fast system. Ventry is just a, a vendor's uh, uh, a brand of regular camera. You can see the resolu spatial resolution is much better, four millimeter versus 7.5 millimeter, and sensitivity is about uh, six times uh, higher. So you can imagine, you can, uh, since the imaging, image is determined by the number of photons. So you have more sensitive and more uh, better spatial resolution. You can either image, you know, instead of eight to 10 minutes, you can do four minutes imaging, or you can actually cut the doses in half. And this is an example of a patient, for instance, scan for five minutes with, uh, uh, five minutes with 10 uh, midi curie of uh, Tetrophosman, uh, which is a standard dosage, um, okay, or basically half of time. So you can do half time imaging in the left, or you can do half dose imaging, okay. So you're gonna ultimately have similar amount of count compared to regular camera. So that allows you to do individualized imaging. Let's say you have a young patient, you don't want to give too much radiation. You can imaging them with 10 minutes, okay, with half of the doses of radioisotope. In the elderly patient who cannot stay still for a long period of time, you can give them regular dosage of uh, radioisotope and image them half of the time, okay? So this new development allows you to customize the, uh, the protocol. Okay, so that's all I have to say about nuclear, a really quick uh, uh, introduction.